Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The family of missing woman Kathleen McCormick Durst accuses a multi billion dollar real estate family of helping cover up her murder for decades. And the judge now saying Robert Durst's murder trial is full steam ahead, despite the defendant suffering from cancer. The question is not whether he can endure the rigors of the trial, the question is whether he can survive at all. Why no one is facing charges for a tiger missing for more than a week, and how the big cat was finally found. I think the public thought it'd be easy to catch a tiger, uh, but it wasn't at all. Plus, a Florida jury deliberating the fate of a former deputy accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motors. We break down closing arguments in the trial of Zachary Wester. You gotta wonder what's in someone's head, a deputy's head. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. The murder trial of the millionaire uh, real estate heir has resumed as new allegations against Robert Durst are being levied by the family of his missing wife. He murdered her and it was a premeditated murder. There was absolutely no question about it. Kathleen McCormick Durst was last seen at the New York home she shared with her husband Robert Durst in 1982. Her family believes Durst had a role in her assumed murder, but her body was never found. Their family attorney held a virtual press conference just an hour before Durst's trial for the murder of his best friend was set to resume and accused Durst's father and brother of helping to cover up Kathy's murder. What type of person remains quiet when their sister-in-law is brutally murdered? According to a motion filed by the prosecution, Douglas Durst knew his brother was stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars from their family business. The Durst organization is a New York real estate company worth billions of dollars. Prosecutors are now saying the alleged theft could have played a role in Kathy's disappearance and tie it to the murder of his best friend, Susan Berman. Susie Berman said the police are contacting me. Los Angeles police are contacting me. They want to talk to me about her Kathy Durst's disappearance. When Susan Berman told him that, you know what, I'm going to talk to investigators, that she sealed her fate. Robert Durst's trial for Berman's murder was halted last year due to the pandemic. Ten witnesses took the stand, including one of Kathy's friends, who said under cross-examination by the defense that Kathy was terrified of Durst's father, Seymour. I was worried that the father was going to kill her. Remember saying that? That he asked? Yes, I do, yes. Now, 78, the defense says Durst suffers from bladder cancer and other ailments that prevent him from actually participating at trial. He spends more than 90% of his time on his back in a bed, a hospital-type bed. He's anemic. He has spinal disease. He has kidney stones. Uh, it's a myriad of conditions. There's not two system of justice in this county, one for rich people and one for everybody else. Mr. Durst is in custody and getting the best treatment possible that they offer at County USC the medical center at the jail. The judge denied the motion for an indefinite stay of trial, saying Durst is able to clearly think since he wrote a letter to the judge earlier this year. The defense has had at least five years to prepare for every contingency in this case. Second of all, there is no evidence that Mr. Durst is mentally incompetent. Indeed, his letter to this court clearly demonstrates his cogent thought the 23 people who served on the jury will be brought in for orientation. The judge will ask them if they have seen any news about the case, if they have discussed the case with anyone, and if they have any health concerns that could prevent them from serving. Also briefly mentioned in court was a letter one of the jurors apparently submitted. You said about the juror who had written the note. Yeah. I, I didn't get it. So, you, you they got, got it. Okay. Okay. Your Honor, two things. I assume uh, the court is going to let us know, obviously, um, the juror does not make determinations about the legal admissibility of the statement. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, Charlie. After jury orientation, each side will have two hours to recap their opening statements and any testimony they deem important from last year. Joining us today is law and crime host and criminal defense attorney Linda Kenny Bodden and Terry Austin. Linda, the judge looks like he's moving forward no matter what. 
And also, was Abrams presser everything he made it out to be? Well, Brian, let's talk about the first question first, okay? This judge made it clear to the defense and to the public that Robert Durst could be wheeled in on his back on a hospital bed. He could be wheeled in on a casket. And as a matter of fact, if need be, they'll have the trial in the morgue because he is going to trial in this courtroom in Los Angeles no matter what happens. Let me just say that. That was very, very, very clear. Uh, the second regarding uh, Attorney Abrams' press conference who represent certain members of the family. You remember, he has sued uh, Deborah Sharitan, who was the second wife of Robert Durst. He has sued her for defamation. Uh, he's had a number of pressers. He didn't really tell us anything new. We know that, according to one of Kathy McCormick's friends, Kathy McCormick Durst's friends, uh, that she may have been threatening to reveal his criminal conduct to the family. However, that doesn't mean the family was concealing it, because it doesn't mean the family even knew about it at that time. So I don't think that went very far. Yeah, it's not the smoking gun we were expecting. It's information we kind of already knew to begin with. Right. The other question is how they're going to tie that into the trial. Uh, Terry, the judge is starting with, quote unquote, jury orientation and motions to delay. You saw there that he denied the motion to delay due to Durst's health. Uh, what does the restart of this case look like? You know what, Brian, trying to reorient this jury is almost like picking a new jury in terms of how long it's going to take. It's been a year, so of course they've talked about the case. It's been a year, so of course they've discussed the case and they've seen news about it. So I think having to go through all of that, asking all of these jurors multiple questions is not a waste of time. Of course he has to do it because now we have this jury that has been sitting for a year and having to listen to the openings again, two hours each, it was torture the first time. It's going to be double torture this time. And honestly, I think that the fact that this jury has to remember evidence. We've had 10 witnesses, as you said. Having to remember that evidence, this to me is grounds for appeal. I think long ago they should have said, okay, start over, new jury, because that's what would be fair to the defendant. Yeah, definitely grounds for appeal. The 14 month break in between, the having, I mean, I've never seen it, Linda, I'm not sure if you've ever seen, seen it, it, doing like this new kind of opening statements. I think it could get overturned on appeal. The problem is, is Robert Durst going to make it through that appeal? I think it might be a moot point at some point uh, with the bladder cancer and other health restrictions that he has, but we'll keep eyes on it and see how that plays out. Of course, Law & Crime has our cameras in there, and we'll be following this trial uh, until the very end. Thank you both. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, when will former Brooklyn Center police officer Kim Potter stand trial for the death of Dante Wright? But first, the big cat has been found in the space city where the tiger on the loose is now and hear from Carol Baskin on the police involvement next. Welcome back. The search is over for a missing tiger in Houston and police say no one is facing charges for the big cat on the loose. Commander, it's been a long week for looking for this guy. It really has been. <laughs> Indy, the tiger missing for nearly a week, has been found. We got him, and he's healthy. Houston police say the tiger wandered away from a home rented by Victor Cuevas. An off-duty deputy testified in court that he saw Cuevas grab the tiger by the collar, kiss it on the forehead, and take it into the house. Cuevas is accused of fleeing shortly thereafter. The cat seemed to be wandering around for a long time before anybody came out the front door looking for it. So that tells me they didn't even know this cat was loose. Big cat lover Carol Baskin says that India is just nine months old and weighs 175 pounds. Fully grown, India could get up to 600 pounds. When it went outside, it like laid down in the grass like, oh, this is so amazing. And when we rescue big cats, we see that all the time because they've been kept inside buildings or on concrete floors because it's easy to hose off. They've never felt what it means to be a tiger and to connect with the earth. And the way they react to that first opportunity is exactly like what I saw in that cat. Cuevas' attorney told us that another man owns the cat, but police say Cuevas' wife, Gia, is the owner. Cuevas was arrested for fleeing, but India remained on the lam until an animal shelter received a tip on Saturday from a concerned citizen. That citizen was in contact with Gia, who is the pet owner, and uh, she wanted to turn the, uh, the tiger over to us. 
Police say they allowed Gia to go with them to the animal shelter because she was under stress. He was later taken to the wildlife sanctuary outside of Dallas. He was in a very small crate when he was brought to us today. And as you can tell, he's in a much bigger uh, crate now and he seems to be doing fine. Houston police are reminding people that tigers should not be kept in houses as pets. Now to Minnesota, where there is a hearing for the former police officer accused of shooting and killing Dante Wright. Former Brooklyn Center officer Kim Potter appeared in court for a pretrial hearing. The Hennepin County judge determined there was enough evidence to proceed with a trial and set her trial date for December 6, 2021. Potter is charged with second degree murder for the death of Dante Wright during a traffic stop. On body camera video, Potter can be heard yelling, I'm going to tase you, before she fired her gun instead of her taser. Potter was a police officer for 26 years before she resigned briefly after the incident. She is currently out of jail on bond. Back with us is criminal defense attorney and host Linda Kenny Bodden and Terry Austin. The hearings seem to be mostly about probable cause in pretrial hearings. Terry, where or why do you think the judge found probable cause here? Well, you know, this was an omnibus hearing. They have the right to listen to all of the evidence, and then the judge makes the determination whether there is probable cause for this manslaughter to charge. And for that, she has to see that there is culpable negligence, which created an unreasonable risk. She probably looked at the video, I'm certain of that, and listened to actually what Kim Potter was saying, her words where she said, I'm going to use the taser, and her words where she actually said, taser, taser, taser. So all of that probably went into the determination. And I'm certain she looked at the police policy. She probably looked at the training that Potter herself actually had to come to a final determination that there was probable cause for this manslaughter to charge. And just a reminder, there are different standards. It's not the same standards that we'll see at trial beyond a reasonable doubt. A little bit different than the grand jury, a preponderance of the evidence. This is probable cause somewhere in between, a little bit lower than what we're typically seeing in trials. Linda, admissibility of work records, training guidelines, witness statements. What kind of pretrial arguments do you think that need to be hashed out in this case? Well, obviously all of the above, but the defense, let me tell you from the defense point of view, they're going to try to uh, limit her training records if indeed they're not helpful. For instance, they're gonna, they don't want to have the fact that she's a training officer and who she trained in, but they may want to have the training records that she had because maybe she wasn't given more training. Maybe she had new taser, tasers and wasn't given more training on that. Maybe the tasers malfunction. I'm sure they're also going to be looking at that because, as you know, the taser has a laser to it, right, Brian? Uh, so they're going to all looking at all all of that right now, and I'm sure the judge is going to be hearing motions on all of that. Yeah, admissibility, keeping things out, that's what we're really going to be arguing. Terry, the trial is set for December 6th. The defense looked like it's going to argue uh, mistake of fact. Could that work here? Well, it could, but it's hard to believe that a mistake of this taser and gun, because the difference between those two devices is so large. The taser, as we know, is yellow as far as the barrel is concerned. It's a different weight, and it's put on the non-dominant side. I do think they're going to try to say, though, that obviously Potter mistaken her, you know, taser and, and used the gun instead. It sounds a little bit like the Amber Geiger case, where she said that she mistaken Botham's apartment for her own. So I think they're going to try to claim that that was, in fact, the mistake of fact, and that's why and she shouldn't be charged here. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, because from my understanding, my little un limited understanding, it's a very different mechanism to take the safety off a gun than it is to activate a taser. That is going to be a hard hurdle for the defense here. We'll see how that works out. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, closing arguments from the trial of former Florida Deputy Zachary Wester. Plus, a jury is now being selected in the Iowa trial of a college student found murdered in a cornfield. A report from outside the convention center where all the action is happening when we come back. Jury selection is underway in the Iowa trial of a man accused of murdering a college student and leaving her body in a cornfield. Our Angela Levy is there for us and explains how the process is moving forward during the pandemic. 
We're in Scott County, Iowa. That's in Davenport, where jury selection is underway in the trial of Christian Bahena Rivera. He's accused of first-degree murder in the death of Molly Tibbetts. Tibbetts left her boyfriend's home in Brooklyn, Iowa, back in July of 2018. She went out jogging, and she never returned. Her boyfriend was out of town on business, and she was staying at his home watching his dogs. A month later, police questioned Christian Bahena Rivera after noticing a vehicle similar to his on surveillance cameras in the area where Tibbetts had been running. And police and prosecutors say Bahena Rivera confessed to her killing and then dumping her body in a cornfield. Now, the trial has been moved here to Scott County, Iowa, that's in Davenport, because of pretrial publicity and concerns that Bahena Rivera wouldn't be able to get a fair trial in the area where this occurred. Now, jury selection is underway here at a convention center. There's social distancing in place so the jurors can be questioned. Some of the jurors have been asked if they formed strong opinions about the case. Some have, and they were dismissed. Other jurors have been questioned about whether or not they believe police can make mistakes and whether or not they believe police are perfect and whether that should impact a juror's ability to find a defendant guilty. So this is a very high-profile case. It's inflamed passions on both sides of the immigration debate since Christian Bahena Rivera was an undocumented immigrant at the time that this murder took place. Jury selection could take up to two days and opening statements could be presented by Wednesday. In Davenport, Iowa, I'm Anjanette Levy for Law and Crime Daily. Thanks, Anjanette. When we come back, the jury is out, but the verdict is not in yet. We take a closer look at the closing arguments from the trial of a former Florida deputy on the other side of this break. Back, a Florida jury is now determining the fate of a former deputy accused of planting drugs on unsuspecting motorists. Zachary Wester is facing 67 charges, including racketeering, false imprisonment, and perjury. Wester took the stand in his own defense and denied allegations he planted drugs on motorists during traffic stops. On Monday morning, the judge denied a defense motion to dismiss the racketeering charge, then both sides delivered closing arguments. Prosecutors say the video is clear. Just look at the body cam video of Deputy Wester planting drugs in Teresa Odom's car. The most incredible thing about the Odom stop is why in the world does the defendant have palmed in his hand, which is clasped like this, not like this, not like this, like this, and you see it in the corner, a plastic baggie by his own admission. Why in the world does he have that there? I would submit that this is objective evidence where you see him planting drugs in the moment. You see something in his hand that has no reason, no logical reason, given this stop and what we know about it, for it to be there. This is him planting evidence, and you see it. His explanation about what is there is not reasonable and makes no sense. In cross-examination, I asked him, okay, you say that you found this, you say it found it there. At what point in the video do you stop to look at? At what point in the video do you make mention of it? At what point in the video do you tell another officer about it? At what point do you tell Ms. Odom about it? At what point do you write it in a report to say it happened? There's a number. We talked about numbers in opening statement from the defense. Zero. It didn't happen. The defense went a different route in their closings. Instead of addressing the video of Odom's arrest, they questioned the credibility of all the witnesses. Yeah. When you're weighing the evidence, the judge went over this with you, there are certain things that you, know, you should look at beyond, you know, obviously using your common sense, but he talks about the instructions say, did the witness seem to have an accurate memory? Was the witness honest and straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? Most of the people that got up there and testified also said, yeah, I'm suing. I'm suing. And at least one of them said, yes, a conviction here would definitely help my civil case. So is there an interest? Yes. And what is that? Money. Let's bring in Linda and Terry one last time. 
Linda, Wester testified without a mask. You think he should have worn one. Why? Uh, because he was twitching and looking threatening. Okay, so I put this mask on. No one can see my... I can't see me twitching. But when you get up there and you... And you're sniffling in a, in a drug case, as you point out, and you're going like this, and you're making all sorts of noises, and you, you kind of have that, like, tough guy cop look. You know, he, he really should have... He's one of the people that should have put a mask on because I think he undercut what his attorney was doing. I mean, a lot of our viewers, especially on YouTube, would agree with you that the twitch of the nose was somewhat bothersome, especially in a drug case. But what did you make of the defense's arguments and Wester testifying in this case? Well, I think the arguments were the best they could make. Sure, you're going to say, uh, you're going to fall into exactly why these people weren't believed in the first place, right? Because they're drug people, they had drugs, they're going to get money. Uh, but then you're falling into, like, blaming the victim, aren't you? But it's the best you could do. And when you have a client who wants to testify, it's kind of like Durst, isn't it, Brian, who wants to testify? We all know that, right? Uh, there's not much you can do as a defense attorney attorney they have to take the stand and you let them take the stand and they either dig their own grave or they get a not guilty yeah it's one of their rights no lawyer or anyone can stop them from doing so if they want to testify they testify terry i know this is no sniffing matter but in the closing <laughs> arguments for the prosecution they suggested a number of motives that he wanted to work narcotics that he maybe even just liked the power uh were these motives persuasive to you you know, it's no sniffing matter and it's no laughing matter. I do think they were persuasive. I mean, listen, whenever you have a motive that involves money, even if it's not a lot of money, the fact that he was going to make $1,000 more, that's enough motive. And the fact that he wanted to go to a more distinguished department, that is a motive. And I actually think because of Wester's personality, wanting the power, being able to influence this power over people that he thinks are more vulnerable, gives him some control. So I absolutely think there was plenty of motive available here. Yeah. And when you think of motives and themes, uh, uh, Linda, just real quickly, some of the ones that you usually use are like the biblical ones, the trying to impress your father or trying to live up to that mentality. That makes sense, right? Absolutely makes sense. Trying to undo your past also from the prior department, Brian. Exactly. Thank you all for joining us here at Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.